Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Well, I'm the teaching pastor here, and so glad to be with you guys as we start our new series, Christmas Unmasked. And I'll explain what that means in a second. But first, I want to explain what something else means. There is an envelope on the chair next to you, or maybe you're sitting on it, um, that says Christmas Offering. So Crossroads Church, twice a year, at Easter and at Christmas, we do a special offering where we ask people to pray about how much they can give towards the overall mission of the church. And let me tell you something that's, you know, there was a missionary a few years back, and he said this. He said, the light that shines furthest shines brightest at home. If you think about a lighthouse, right, the lighthouse that goes way out into the darkness and shines and shines and shines, you don't want to be looking at it up close because it'll blind you, right? And that, I, what he was talking about is that, that a church that reaches around the world starts with strength at home. And that's what this offering, a lot of what we do with this, you know, during the pandemic, I was just blown away by how generous you guys continued to be, even though there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, I'll never forget a missionary called me. He's like, Joel, we have the ability to go feed some people in Guatemala. Like we've gotten permission from the government to go feed them. So in Guatemala, they didn't have the option of calling DoorDash when they got hungry, right? In Guatemala, if you ran out of food, they would put a, you'd put a white flag out in front of your house and everybody was locked down on quarantine and you couldn't leave your house. So they'd put a white flag out when they were out of food. And my friend got permission from the government to take food directly to people. And he's like, I just need the money to do it. We didn't have to take up a special offering or anything. I called Marcus and he's like, how much money you need? We'll send the check. And we shot the money. I think we sent it via Venmo. Nobody uses checks anymore, right? We shot him the money, and the next day, he's buying food with that money. And the cool part about it to me was this. The church, you guys had been such faithful givers, we didn't have to go take a special offering. We had the money available to bless the world, literally the world, because of you guys. So that is what this offering is about. And this, this offering we're going to take on the 19th is going to be specifically focused on two areas, okay? One is we, we just got done doing a planning retreat for next year for the church, and I, I don't think I've ever been more excited to be part of what's going on here at the church. There's some cool stuff going on at the church. We've got a new children's director. Her name's Patty. You may have met her. Yeah. We have just implemented a brand new, it's the best children's program in the country. It's called Orange. If you know what, like those of you who are, know what, what I'm talking about, you're like, oh, Orange, that's a good, it's a great children's program, right? It's the best there is. It ain't cheap, but we're going to use it because, man, what, there's nothing, what's a better investment than pouring God's word into your kids? There isn't one. Yeah. So we're using orange, and that's we're, we're going to use some of the money to help with that. And the other thing we're using money for is to help up up our online game. So um, I, you know, I, a lot of people are attending church online. I am a guy that I just don't, I can't do online church. But I know a lot of people that use the online because they, you know, they've got jobs that they can't can't make it out on Sunday. And what we're going to do is we're going to up our game so that we create a unique experience for those online, not so they don't just feel like there's somebody outside watching a service that they're not a part of. We're actually going to create a unique experience for them online where they get to have, a, anyways, the tech guys know what they're talking about, but that's where the money's going to go to. So I want to encourage you guys, pray about how you're going to be a part of this Christmas offering this year. And uh, you know, the Lord is going to do his work and you can partner with him to be part of it or you can miss out on it. So it's your call. And one of the greatest ways we can show that we're in fully is through our finances. That's why Jesus talked about money all the time. He's like, where your treasure is, it shows where your heart is. So I want to just encourage you guys, pray. This isn't trying to strong arm you or anything, but it's, it's a principle I've seen. So I want to encourage you guys to pray about how much you're going to give towards that. Take this home with you, pray over it, and the Lord will give you, um, if you're supposed to be part of it, the amount that you're supposed to give. So Amen. cool. Christmas Unmasked. Now, <clears throat> I'm a pastor's kid. I've been hanging out in the church for 43 years. I was basically born on the front row of a church pew. <laughs> and one of the things that I despise the most in the world is boring sermons. Yes. Amen. I don't like them. I've sat through way too many of them in my life. In fact, when my wife and I were looking for churches in Houston, uh, we would go to these churches, and if, if the sermon just, the pastor just didn't seem, he just kept droning on about stuff that was just boring and didn't make any sense, I'd be like, let's leave, Emily. And she'd be like, you can't just leave in the middle of service. I'm like, yeah, well, actually, we can just leave. Watch this. Here's this trick. This is a secret to getting out of a boring sermon. Um, you just act like a really important phone call came. And you go like this. You go, oh, oh, like that. Exactly like that. 
And then you have your wife follow you five minutes later. But now I'm on to your game, so don't try it here, okay? <laughs> but I would just, I, I, I just got so frustrated with boring sermons. And here's what I think makes a boring sermon. A boring sermon is something that you don't get clearly explained to you how you can apply the truth of God's word to the truth of your situation. So my goal today, what I'm going to share with you today could literally change everything for you. And my goal, Lord help me do it is to make it super practical, but there's some really deep stuff we're gonna talk about this morning. It's really deep stuff, so you got, you, I, I know it was deep because last service, people were just locked in. They were like super quiet listening. So I won't be offended if you're super quiet listening, but what I wanna to talk to you about today and this whole series is about the idea that God is always working in your life. And in the moment when you're calling out to him going, God, where are you? there's a very good chance that he is working in a way that you just can't see it because God's always doing 10,000 things in your life. And if you're lucky, you'll see maybe three of them, but he's always working. But it's like he's got this mask over what he's doing and we can't see it. So that's why we're calling the series Christmas Unmasked because we're going to look at what the story of Christmas has to show us about God's hidden work. You, 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 I've been so enjoying being at the grocery store again and, and being able to see people's faces instead of them being like, like, are they smiling at me or mad at me? You can't tell, right? Masks, I don't like masks. Whatever, we won't go into that, the politics of that. But I don't like being able to see people's faces. And I believe that God wants to show us his face at work in us. So I'm gonna tell a story this morning. Uh, the best way I can explain this is a few years ago, I was working at a church as a worship leader, doing what Jeremiah does here for us. Um, oh, by the way, y'all, check this out. Next year, Jeremiah's going to be mad at me for telling you this. Jeremiah has a bunch of original music, worship music, that we're going to be introducing next year. They're going to have it on Spotify. It's going to be part of our series. It's going to be super exciting. So you guys, we're gonna see, you're going to hear some really great music coming out of the church here. Uh, Jeremiah's got a lot in him, and we're going to pull it out of him. So I was a worship leader, was not writing original music, but... Uh, which maybe is why I got fired. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> one day while I was gone on vacation, the pastor offered my job to the guy that was filling in for me. <laughs> didn't, <laughs> didn't even tell me. I was devastated. This guy was a friend of mine. So I went to him like, yo, bro, what's up? You offered my job to that guy? And he's like, oh yeah, I was wanting to talk to you about that. Uh, yeah, I'm like, and, and he basically said, you know, you're going to need to be moving along here soon. I was like, oh, and I was devastated. I was like, what are we supposed to do? So I started praying about it. And I'm like, God, where are you in the middle of this? Man, there was, the church was growing. Things were getting great. And my ministry was growing. And I had this dual thing going. It was amazing. But I was just like, what is going on here? And in the middle of it, it's kept, we had an opportunity to move to Houston. Emily got offered a job in Houston. And, um, and I was like, well, I have no job. So I do need a sugar mama. So like... <laughs> Okay, I guess we're moving to Houston. And I felt like the Lord said, this is where I want you to go, Houston. But where we ended up in Houston, we found this house. It was the, I knew it was the place we were supposed to be, but it's like out in the middle of nowhere in the woods in spring, which isn't even Houston. It's like the woods, North, represent for spring, right? Ow! So we're out there in the middle of spring. And I remember just thinking, what are we doing here? We couldn't find a church most, mostly because I wouldn't stick around long enough to see if I liked the church, but <laughs> we couldn't find a church. We just, I felt so alone out there. I'm like, God, I know you told us to move here. Like, I'm almost certain of it. I'm starting to doubt, though. But where are you in the middle of this? And it felt so lonely, but it was interesting because over the next four or five years, slowly God started connecting dots in my life and putting things together. And as I look back now, I see he strategically positioned me right where I was supposed to be. There were people in those same woods with me who helped me with some areas like of influence that what I'm doing today with the writing the books and the podcast and stuff like that, they taught me how to do that. And who would have thought they lived just a few blocks from us out in the middle of the woods in Spring, Texas. It was like, th this was God strategically moving me there. But at the time I was going, where are you in all this? Because I feel alone. I feel like you forgot I'm down here. And I have no clue what is going on. Now, here's what I know about every one of you. 
there's a domain, an area in your life right now where you're calling out to God and you're going, where are you? What's the deal? I've been trying to follow you, man. I've been trying to keep the faith. I've been trying to hold on. I've been trying. Where are you? You're looking at that situation with your son and you're going, it's just he keeps making one stupid decision after another. You're like, God, I've been praying for him. We didn't raise him to be like this. God, where are you? Why aren't you intervening and doing something for my son? And you've been praying and you're starting to go, what, what's the point of even praying? Some of you, it's in your marriage. You've been praying and praying, Lord, heal my marriage, man. Help, help us get over this. Help us get over this hump. And it's not happening. You're like, God, I thought you're supposed to be the miracle worker and all that. You know, we sing that way maker, miracle worker. And you're like, I want to believe, but where are you? What's going on? Some of you, it's in your finances. You just can't get over the hump. Every time you think you're almost there, it's like, bam, you get hit with another bill. that The car breaks down or something. You're just like, I cannot break free from this. God, what is the deal? And you're like, God, are you going to rescue me or what? I'm doing my best. I'm even paying my tithe, right? Isn't that how it works? You pay your tithe and then you pull the slot machine. Then God, you know, what's the deal? That is not how God works, by the way. But we've all got areas of our life. Maybe it's in your career. You're looking at this job and you're just like, I can't take another day of this. You're even right now dreading going back to work tomorrow. And you're, and you're mad at me for bringing it up right now because you're like, Ah, oh, I can't do this anymore, God. But if I quit this job, that's all I got. Like, what? We all got an area like that, right? We've all got an area where we're going, God, what are you doing? Where are you? And the Christmas story is an example of a time when there were a lot of people going, God, where are you? The Israel, the people of Israel, they were calling out for a savior. They were in a very dark place. They had a government that was very oppressive, a government that was just sucking taxes out of them. And they're like calling out to God. And they're like, God, where are you? And the crazy thing is God showed up right in the middle of their distress and they didn't even know what had hit them because he showed up in a way they completely did not expect. Because what happens is when the infinite enters the finite, when that which is all-powerful, all-encompassing, which is God himself. He is the most powerful force in the universe. When he comes into our finite, limited world, we're finite, we're limited, and we know we're limited. You've been trying to fix that situation in your life, and it's not getting fixed. When the infinite comes into the finite, it becomes impossible to see everything that is happening. And do you know why? Because there's two ways to make it impossible for someone to see. One way is to just turn out all the lights and make it completely dark. And you're all like, I can't see, I can't see. But another way to make it impossible to see everything that's going on is to make it so ridiculously bright that you're blinded by the light. And God is light. And when he shows up in a situation, when the infinite enters your finite world, it becomes impossible to see everything that's happening because it's just too bright. So I want to throw a little mental shift to start the morning with for you. What if your lack of feeling like God is there and you feel like you're wandering through the darkness isn't actually wandering through the darkness? What if it's the fact that his work is so bright in your life that you just can't even see it? It's impossible to see all that's going on because you're just blinded by like that lighthouse that's just, wow. One of the best example I can think of is, you know, this, this little laser pointer here. Anybody have a laser pointer pointed in your eyes? It hurts. You're not supposed to look at laser pointers. But you know, this little laser right here, you see it back there on the wall? It's a bunch of light compressed into a tiny, small space. And do you know if you get enough light into a small space, you can make a laser that can actually cut through metal. Because it's a bunch of light compressed into a small space. And it looks small, but it's powerful. I think that's an example of what God's light looks like in our lives. We just can't comprehend it sometimes because it's so powerful. It's his almighty God shows up in this light that's just so powerful. And we look at him we're like, well, that's nothing. Have you looked at it in the eye? Because it'll blind you. I think that's what it's like a lot of times in our lives. When we look around, we're like, man, I feel like it's so dark. I feel so like it's so dark. 
And that's where the challenge comes for us as Christians. Because here, here, here's what it says. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was, was God and was with, was with God. He was in the beginning with God. It says, all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And the life was the light. There's that word light of men. And it says, the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. Darkness cannot operate in the presence of light. And some of you this morning, you're like, man, the darkness is all on top of me. I feel it. There's death all around me. There's just darkness, man. And let me tell you this. If you're a child of God, this is your promise right here. You will not be overcome by darkness because the light of God is shining. And it may be so bright in your life that you can't see what's going on. But don't ever doubt this. God is at work. And that's what faith is about. We walk by faith, not by what we can see, because sometimes God's work is so bright that we can't even see it with our eyes. So we have to walk by faith. And faith is believing what's true, even when it doesn't seem like it's true. Faith is saying, man, I believe that God has a plan for my son. It says, he, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which the Father prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I believe God has that for my son, but, and, but I'm not seeing it. And man, I'm getting really discouraged. But I'm going to hold on to faith knowing that it is true what God says, even though it doesn't look like it. I know that God wants my marriage strong. I know he gave me that man. Sometimes he wished he'd take that man, but I know he gave me that man. <laughs> and I'm going to hold on to faith. Even though I don't see it, God's light work in my life is so bright, I may not be able to get, understand what's going on. And that's what it says. And without this kind of faith that we're talking about, faith that believes what's true, even when it doesn't seem like it's true, it's impossible to please God. Whoever would draw near to God, if you want to be close to God, it says you've got to believe that he exists, that he's working, and that he gives a reward to those who seek him. There's a reward for those who stay in faith and believe even when it looks like what they believe isn't true. So the question is, are you going to hold on and trust that actually this isn't darkness that's overcoming me? It's actually the brightness of God's work that's so big in my life, I can't even understand it all. And it's blinding. That's where faith comes in. King Solomon said this. He said, it's the glory of God to conceal things. Because God's work is so big, he'll often make it seem like he's hiding himself. But it says, it's the glory of kings. That's us. We're now a royal priesthood, it says. It's the glory of kings to search things out. So we don't just sit around going, oh, I don't understand what God's doing. We start going, I know God's doing something because that's faith, and I'm going to start looking for evidence of it. I'm going to search out what he's doing. And you may never understand all of it, but I'm going to spend time searching it out. That's what true faith is. Faith isn't just sitting there going, well, I don't know what's going on. It's faith is saying, God, I'm looking for you in this, and I believe you're in there somewhere. I heard a story about a, two kids. There was one that was super optimistic. Another one was super pessimistic. Christmas time came, and the parents were like, we have got to like, get these kids balanced out. Like Our one son is just way too optimistic. The other one's way too pessimistic. So for the pessimist, they, brought him, they bought him this just amazing new go-kart. And, and, and the, they, on Christmas morning, they brought it out to the son, the pessimistic son. The pessimist son's like, <laughs> Oh, and they're like, what's the matter, son? This is, we got you a go-kart. He's like, I know, but I know it's just a matter of time till it breaks down. <laughs> and the optimistic son, they, they bought him a giant pile of manure. <laughs> and they brought it out to the son, and the son was like, <sighs> and he jumped in and started digging through the manure. And they're like, son, son, what are you doing? That's manure. And he goes, I know, but with this much manure, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. Search it out, baby. There's got to be a pony in there somewhere. That's what faith does. And the Christmas story is a story of a, of a world full of darkness. And in one moment, everything changes. And there was a promise hundreds of years before. God made a promise to a prophet named Isaiah. He said, 
hey guys, I know you feel like you're walking in darkness, but I'm, I'm promising you something. Pretty soon a deliverer is going to come. And it says this, it says, and those who walked in darkness, they will have seen a great light. He says, I'm going to show up with so much light, you're not even going to know what hit you. He says, those who dwelt in the land of the deep darkness, on them a light has shown. He says, guys, I'm going to show up. The light is going to come with Jesus. Once and for all, the lights are going to get turned on when Jesus shows up. But you're not going to understand what's happening because it's going to be a veiled, masked work. It's going to be covered. And that's what it says, for unto us a child is born. This is the same passage. He says, the light that's coming, coming through a child. You go, what? How that? How's that possible? And he says, to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. So you know what this is saying here? He says, when Jesus comes, he's going to switch on a light and it's going to be like one of those fluorescent lights that starts a little bit bright and by the time it done, it's just, you've been in a gym like that, had a gym where they turn on the lights and it starts getting brighter and brighter, and brighter, and brighter, and brighter, and brighter. And the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter, and brighter, and brighter. At the moment that Jesus came, the lights got switched on because it, the infinite touched the finite. And his work has been forcefully advancing, not only in the world, but in your life. Amen. And you, you, you remember what it's like, the darkness you used to be in? Yes. And you're like, man, I still feel that way. Hey, it's, it's light now because he turned on the light in your life. And it's just getting brighter and brighter and brighter. Amen. But when Jesus showed up, he also made the promise in Isaiah. He said this, but listen, I need to warn you guys. The light's going to come on. It's going to get bright here. But he's going to show up in a way that you didn't expect him to look. It says, like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and he held them in low esteem. You ever been walking down the street and you see somebody that's in such bad shape, you just, it's just uncomfortable to look at it. You're just like, that's the way it said Jesus is going to show up. So my question for you is, what if some of those areas in your life that are so uncomfortable that you don't even want to look at are right where Jesus' light is shining through? And I think that's an amazing picture. Is that we're, we're kind of soft. We can't handle reality because reality is very bright and it's God's glory. But the more we come to know him, the more solid and strong he makes us and we can handle what is real. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, y'all are quiet, so I know you're listening. <laughs> it says, you'll know everything completely just as God knows me completely. Little by little, when that light gets turned on, it gets clearer and clearer that God has been working in your life. Even right now, when you don't see it, the question is, are you going to stay in faith and believe that one of these days my eyes will see it? That's why Paul says this. Therefore, we don't lose heart. We don't get tired. We don't run out of energy. Though outwardly, we're wasting away, inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. So this light and momentary affliction, the struggles you're going through at work with your family, with your kids, the financial struggles, it says it's preparing in us an eternal weight of glory, which is that shining presence that's beyond all comparison. So here's the way he says we do. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary not going to last. But what is unseen is eternal. Yes. Yes. Amen. So, so the challenge for us is, what are we going to fix our eyes on? And the beautiful thing is, as, as believers in Christ now, we have access to a different kind of vision. This is what Paul was talking about when he said this in Ephesians. He said, I'm going to pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so then you may know the hope to which he has called you. I'm going to pray that you don't just look with these eyes. I'm going to pray that you look with these eyes here that can see a deeper reality. The fact that what you see is not what's actually going on. What you see is driven by what is unseen. And I want you to see what's unseen. I want you to see God's work. Just a little glimpse of it, because remember, it's the glory of kings to search out a matter. He says, I want to see the hope which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. That's you. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. This, this is what I, I believe should be the prayer for all of us. And I would encourage you to take a picture of this. When you wake up in the morning, you turn on the news and you see the more bad news. When you get the phone call about what's going on with your kids. 
When you look at the bank account balance, you go, Lord, help me. Here's what I would, I would encourage you to pray. God, give me eyes to see what my eyes can't see. Let my spiritual eyes see what's actually at work, what's behind the mask of what I see right now. Let me see with your eyes the light that is shining in the darkness. Give me a little bit more clarity to see with the spiritual eyes what's going on in the physical. And I pray that in my family. I pray that when, when I look at my son and I'm so frustrated with what he's doing, and I'm like, how can a kid make so many bad decisions? I didn't raise my kid that way. Lord, I pray you'd begin to show me the spiritual reality beyond what's going on in my son. And then show me the spiritual truth that I need to tap into to help my son in this situation. Lord, with, man, with my kids, Lord, I pray with my country. Some of you are looking around at your country and going, what is happening to our country? For good reason. It's insane. The good news is stupidity is not a long-term game plan. At some point, <laughs> things are going to have to straighten out, right? So don't get discouraged. Say, God, give me eyes to see what you're doing. Because right in the middle of all this insanity, God's doing something. Amen. He is. And he's going to accomplish his purposes. And you say, man, God, God, give me eyes to see what's going on in myself. Because let me just be honest. I don't like myself. I don't like what I see when I look in the mirror. I don't like what I see when I respond to my kids that way. And if you're honest with yourself, there's some things about you that you don't like. And the only way you're going to get over those things is to recognize that you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand. You're not here by accident. He made you for a purpose. And the way he sees you is not the way you see yourself. And when you get a glimpse because the light turns on and you see, oh, that's how God sees me. God's not mad at me anymore because of Jesus. That changes everything. And some of you have been looking at what you see instead of what you don't see. And God says, I need you to, to, to start paying attention to the work that I want to do within you because the transformation that you're looking for on the outside, the way you respond to things, the way you feel about things is going to start with a transformation on the inside. It's never external. Some of us, we think if we can just get away from this environment or this situation, it'll change. Nope, you can change wherever you are because it always starts inside. So... That would, what I'd encourage you to pray. And there's this, there's this line by a guy named Carl Jung. He says this. He says, modern man does not see God because he will not look low enough. Most of us are sitting around waiting for the cavalry to, cavalry to come. Like the angels. That, we need a, an army of angels to come rescue us. And God's like, no, I already came and rescued you. And the rescue showed up in a little baby in a manger. The rescue is already here. But remember when light shows up in our world, we can't comprehend all of what's going on. And oftentimes, we're looking out here for God to rescue us. And he's like, look at the lowest place, because that's where I'm working right now, because it's a hidden, masked work. And maybe the very thing in your life that you're looking at, you're saying, that's the problem. Maybe that's actually what God wants to use to bring the solution. And maybe that's what actually God is working through, if you'll start to get it from a different perspective. Let the light shine a little bit brighter you're looking up here. You're looking for God to rescue you out here. But he's saying, no, I already came. With Jesus Christ, I set things up for victory. It's done. So start paying attention now to a whole new reality. And Lord, give me the eyes to see. Back to this prayer. Lord, give me the eyes to see what I can't see in my family, at work, in my country, in myself. And I believe as you do that, it could change everything for you. Think about the peace that could come. When you, read, when you listen to the news and you're like, wow, it's getting really jacked up. God must be up to something. Man, my son's getting worse. God must really be going after him. And he's just running harder. Man, the finances are they're just not happening. Man, he really must want me to lean into him for all of my needs instead of depending on that money. What if you started to see things from that standpoint? Couldn't that bring some major peace and joy and confidence? And the light would just get a little bit brighter in your life and you'd start to see it's not the darkness that's making it hard to see. It's the power of his light in your life that's changing everything. You guys receive that? Yeah. Let me pray for you. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.